Uh, waking up the morning of uh, climbing onto a rocket is an interesting feeling. There's no fear. Uh, there's a high degree of awareness, and, and everybody is concentrating and thinking about procedures. We have spent, uh, at this time, about a year getting ready for this flight, and we were ready. Uh, walking out, you see some friendly faces behind the cameras, which is always nice. Driving out to the pad, you notice the pad is deserted, uh, and you're pretty much alone, but you know that there's a lot of people who are with you in spirit. You'll see the sparklers uh, igniting to burn off the excess hydrogen here as the main engines ignite. Main engines ignite about six seconds prior to liftoff, and it's a very long six seconds uh, because by this time your brain is working uh, overtime. You'll see an interesting shot of the flame trench and all the water uh, that is used to damp the acoustic vibrations during ascent so the vehicle is not damaged. Liftoff, as you watch from the ground, the vehicle appears to climb very slowly and stately, but I'll tell you there's nothing slow about it when you're sitting in the cockpit. The only two words that came to my mind, other than the technical operations of the vehicle were speed and power. The vehicle has a tremendous amount of speed and tremendous power as you're climbing uphill. As the vehicle passes through the region of maximum dynamic pressure, it pitches and yaws into the relative wind, and we experienced oscillations that you can't see on the video here of about plus and minus two degrees per second. And that's an interesting feeling in itself. You can feel each and every one of the seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and when it starts moving around, it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Once we got up on orbit, uh, we had an extremely clean vehicle, very, very minor problems. Uh, I think one heater was, had failed, uh, very inconsequential. Quick tour of the payload bay. We had the uh, USMP pallet uh, with two major experiments, Mephisto, a French materials processing uh, canister, and then uh, from JPL and Stanford, uh, Lambda Point, which was a, a helium experiment that they had very successful runs with. Uh, the attitude sensor package, which was uh, three sensors uh, provided by ESA to look at advanced spacecraft uh, uh, control and uh, guidance systems. And then uh, we swing around and look at the Canadian test article, which Steve and Lacey used for uh, all the space vision system experiments. Lewis provided us a, uh, a gas can with the tank pressure control experiment, which was a little fluid uh, control effort. And of course, we had the Canada arm, which uh, Lacey, Steve, and Tammy used extensively in, in their series of runs. And of course, in the back of the bus is the Iris uh, Legio Sun Shield, and looks like we're getting ready to deploy here. Yeah, here we are preparing to deploy the Iris Legio system on flight day two. After the orbiter was maneuvered to the proper attitude, we opened the Sun Shield to reveal the spacecraft and the deployment system inside. All this was done against the backdrop of a beautiful sunrise, by the way. Uh, the satellite was spun up to 65 RPMs and then deployed out of the payload bay. Uh, with all its shimmering surfaces, Jim Weatherby commented it looked like R2-D2 coming out of the payload bay. But you can see the shuttle provided a very stable platform for the deploys. It goes right up the, the line of the tail. The, the space shuttle system, of course, deployed the satellite into a 160 nautical mile orbit. And then there was a perigee kick motor on the IRIS deployment system that placed the satellite into an elliptical transfer orbit. And subsequent to that, an apogee kick motor on the Legios itself fired to place the satellite into a 5,800 kilometer <laughs> circularized orbit so it could then begin its scientific operations of mapping the Earth's surface gravity and, and looking for movement in tectonic plates. Uh, here's uh, Biggs down on the mid deck. He's uh, just left his uh, portable computer and he's looking at the uh, Boeing furnace that we flew. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's two furnaces. I guess Lacey's uh, making lunch there. But uh, we're running the uh, forward furnace. We've got two cameras set up, and Bakes is just uh, doing some check out there. Uh, the furnace processed uh, cadmium telluride crystals, and we had two uh, separate runs, two samples each. And basically, we talked to it with the computer that you see there. Apart from the uh, space vision system that I had, I had a series of uh, Canadian experiments that reflected our long-term plan or portions of our long-term plan. Here is a phase partitioning experiment where we have two polymers, and you can liken that to uh, oil and vinegar, and they tend to separate out in space. And uh, it just so happens that healthy blood cells will go with one polymer, and unhealthy blood cells will go with the other polymer. And my job was to determine the resolution of that separation on space. 
We also had another experiment uh, concerning materials degradation uh, in low Earth orbit. We had 378 samples on the witness plates of the arm, and throughout the entire mission, we exposed uh, at night these samples to the ramjet direction. And many of these samples are samples or substitute samples that we plan to use on the mobile servicing system for Space Station, which will help to uh, assemble Space Station. And another experiment that I had in the mid-deck is a, a small furnace from Queen's University that is about eight inches uh, on a side. It's a cubic furnace, but it can obtain about uh, 1,000 degrees C. And we were looking at the diffusion of one liquid metal into another uh, liquid metal. And we were able to do about 40 samples throughout the, the course of the flight. Another of the experiments we were operating in these very close quarters was the heat pipe performance experiment. Beneath that shroud, there are four spinning heat pipes. And here, we're adjusting the power input to those heat pipes. Along each of the heat pipes, there are eight temperature sensors that are read out on that display. And by looking at the time history of those temperature sensors, we can determine how efficiently those heat pipes transport heat in microgravity. And Hughes is hoping that these data will allow them to uh, reduce the weight and size of heat pipe system on commercial satellites. Here we see uh, Shep working, uh, preparing to get into the uh, LBMP, lower body negative pressure. Uh, this is one of many medical uh, experience that we did on board mainly to look at extended duration orbiters and uh, readaptation to uh, 1G. We also uh, used Florinef uh, in one case, in the, which is a drug to help you maintain water, and used the LBMP device to uh, test the effects of that. At least once per day we had a media event and it was an interesting diversion to an otherwise busy day. We could put our books down and uh, talk about what we were doing. Uh, they were kind of fun performing these uh, interviews. With a very busy schedule like this, uh, during the flight, we often uh, barely had time to grab a bite to eat uh, whenever and wherever we could find it. And uh, a lot of our meals were just about like that during the course of the day as we were working all these experiments. Watch the veteran Jim Weatherby keep his dish very close to his mouth while the rookie here, Steve McLean, plays with his food and nearly loses control of his granola and probably embarrasses his mom in the... In the <laughs> Steve, being a national champion gymnast, tried to instruct some of us in, in, the, uh, in the art. He gave me a two on this particular <laughs> maneuver. <laughs> I was happy with it, though. <clears throat> and no, uh, no post-flight movie would be complete without the famous floating juice drop. So we bring you Dr. Tamara Jernigan chasing tropical punch through space. Now you see it. Now you don't. Zero gravity makes some things easier to do, like uh, passing uh, computer disks around the mid-deck. And you just saw one fly out of a computer there. With Jim Weatherby on board, though, uh, it's dangerous for anything that looks remotely edible to be floating around <laughs> free like that. We conducted RMS ops. Tammy and I operated the robot arm on nearly every day for CanX2, primarily SVS. And on flight day 10, we culminated that by deploying it. We didn't know how it was going to react when we released the snares in the end effector. And it turned out to be very, very stable. So pulling off of the uh, grapple fixture was no problem. And from there on, we flew proximity ops with it and over the use. And the unique thing about this flight is it is the first time that we've used cameras to do station keeping operation. Uh, on orbit, we station keep that 150 feet, and when we had good video, uh, we had good range uh, data on the system. And uh, see, this was very, very uh, exciting to do, watching the CTA uh, keeping station keeping with it and then departing with it. That was the set one burn where we intentionally did not blast the target. You'll see here in a second, in preparation for space station rendezvous, we do intentionally blast the CTA with the braking jets. And there it is there to see uh, the effect of the jets on the, on the target. This was uh, about a one second blast from 150 feet. And it will help us in the, the design of the space station and development of the procedures used in rendezvous for the space station uh, when we analyze the data to see the effects of the blast. 
it's interesting in proximity operations, our relative velocities are so sometimes as low as a half an inch per second between the orbiter and the target. You'll get a feel for how fast we're going around the Earth in a second. Uh, our relative velocity around the Earth is about a half a million times faster than that. We passed overhead the CTA. And you see, see it <clears throat> down there uh, moving in relation to the clouds. It was pretty exciting. It's one of the most enjoyable things about spaceflight is being able to see the Earth from space, and we carry numerous uh, cameras on board to uh, document this. Uh, one of them is a uh, Aeroflex 16 millimeter, and we have two on a dual bracket. You can see there is a Hasselblad 70 millimeter format camera. We carried a Linhoff camera, which is a large format camera, in addition to those, and a standard uh, 35 millimeter cameras, Nikon. Uh, in a minute, you'll see. I think one of the most beautiful spots in the world is from space, which is the uh, Bahamas uh, off the coast of Florida. We caught it here in the early morning uh, with some sun glint. Coming up is uh, one of my favorite shots. We, we were able to get a, uh, a panoramic view of the U.S., the entire U.S. coming from California across to Florida. Unfortunately, we ran out of film by the time we got to Florida. That trip takes us about seven and a half minutes. So since we didn't have enough time to show you that, uh, this is about six times normal speed. And there you see California. You can see the Central Valley, the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, in the center of the picture now is the Salton Sea, Great Bas Basin in the western U.S., uh, Gulf of Baja down there in the lower corner left. It's amazing how far north you can see, and we'll illustrate that a little bit later too. Coming up on the right is White Sands. And to the left of White Sands, you can see the Rio Grande River. Uh, south of White Sands, El Paso. Now we're coming across Texas, looking north into New Mexico. Coming up, uh, again, this is six times normal speed, uh, which we had to do so you could see this entire uh, clip. On the right, uh, we'll be coming up Houston. You can see the river valleys in Texas. There you see Houston and the uh, Galveston Bay. On the lower left now, coming across uh, New Orleans, Lake Pontchartrain, the uh, Mississippi River Delta there in the center of the picture now, Mobile Bay, and the uh, Gulf Coast of Florida. And of course, that was kind of the route that we took for entry. Uh, and uh, it took us right across the U.S. into the Gulf of Mexico, over to Florida, onto the Hack. Handling qualities of the airplane are exceptional. Uh, it was, it's really a beautiful airplane to fly. We had spent, uh, both Mike and I had spent uh, at least eight years getting ready for this moment and a thousand approaches in the shuttle training airplane. You've heard all the bad things uh, about the low lift to drag ratio and zero thrust, an Elevon configured vehicle with reverse flight path sensing. But if the, if the task is not complicated by bad weather, it is a beautiful flying airplane. It was, it was well worth the wait uh, to get a chance to, to land the vehicle. After we touched down, uh, we rolled out for several more seconds. When we got to our derotation speed, Mike actuated the drag chute, and you'll see that come out as we initiate derotation. The drag chute, I think, is a good system. I was, I was happy to deploy it. Both Mike and I had worked on the development of the drag chute system for, for several years. It did pull to the right almost exactly the way uh, that it pulled on Hoot uh, on the last mission. But, it, but for me, it was nothing unexpected. They had showed me what it might feel like in the simulator pre-launch, and it was exactly uh, the way they had showed it. And then at about 60 knots, Mike jettisons the chute. And then we roll to a stop with very little braking. I think the system is a good one, and it will help us uh, someday if we ever do have any problems with tires or uh, blown tires or, or brake problems. <laughs> 